I'm Paul Kudrowski, and I'm, uh, I'm moderating this panel. I'm a partner with a venture capital firm called SK Ventures out of San Diego, and uh, we're really happy to do this. So uh, the, the topic, for better or for worse, technology's transformative role in developing regions, which is a real mouthful, so we'll just talk about technology in developing regions instead. Um, <laughs> We've got a, uh, for sort of a little bit of an opening preamble for me, I'll just quickly we'll quickly introduce our, our, our panel. We've got a great um, panel for this subject, or for this topic, uh, starting from my farthest left. I've got some feedback going on. I'm not sure if that's... Okay, you're way ahead of me. Uh, Stephanie Don Friedberg, who's the CIO with the World Bank, way down far left. Uh, Kentura Toyama, who's an associate professor of community information at the University of Michigan beside Stephanie. On my left, Hilton Romanski, who's a senior vice president and chief business officer at Cisco. On my right, Dennis O'Brien, who's the chairman of Digicel. And on, my, on the far end down here is Joe Muchero, who's a cabinet secretary in information and communication technologies. Is that right? Yep. Yeah. In Ke from Kenya. Correct. Right. Okay. So that's our group. So we've got a great sort of eclectic mix of technology policy and uh, you know, people right on the ground. So I thought maybe just to open up the discussion, it's just sort of worth reminding ourselves that we're sort of bipolar in many ways on this topic. You know, there's this kind of uh, almost extremes of opinion where there, you'll see people talking about this sort of notion that there's, a, there's this great leap that's happening that in some ways developing markets are hugely advantaged with respect to technology because they don't have the encumbrance of all of the sorts of things we've built up over decades of building telecommunications infrastructure and financial and banking infrastructure. So, you know, there's this notion years ago in China that you could sort of leap straight to wireless. Well, there's this notion taking hold in sort of many of the more euphoric types as they think about technology and developing markets. They think about this idea that you're able to leap over a lot of the encumbrances in all of these different systems that are maybe holding you back. And that's sort of this more almost a sort of utopian view of what's happened, what can happen, I suppose, as opposed to what is happening in, in sort of developing markets with respect to technology. And then you have the, almost the other extreme opinion out there, which is that this is you know, a, a difficult and almost insurmountable problem in many um, developing markets. That they have you know, the, the issues with respect to education or even with respect to the can, um, energy, energy intermittence or you know, the stability of the, of the financial system or all of these sorts of problems. Or, or, or we'll talk about this sort of broadband gaps and all of these different bits and pieces that are required to sort of build uh, kind of a holistic technology infrastructure or, or even issues with respect to inequality that crop up really quickly in these markets as they start trying to become more aggressive about building out technology. So, you know, there is this almost bipolar view out there with respect to what's happening in these markets. And so I hope, you know, I think the idea here is we'll, we'll talk about each of these sorts of extreme views and maybe try to, you know, figure out exactly what's, what's really happening and what we should expect over the next few years. So maybe the best place to start, and I'll, we'll start maybe right on the ground, um, with you, Joe, if you don't mind, right. and talk a little bit about, and we talked about this sort of coming in, but talk a little bit about, you know, what you're seeing, and maybe specifically start off inside of, you know, mobile and finance, but, you know, spread out from there. What are you seeing on the ground? Is there, do you feel like you have an advantage as you think about for this sort of notion of for better or for worse? Is it, is it good to be Kenya today as you think about what's happening with respect to, you know, the technology and the way it's changing the way your economy works? Thank you very much. <clears throat> yes, yeah, so I think, let me start with the mobile technology. We didn't have uh, fixed lines in the same way the rest of the world in the developed markets had. So we were left with the mobile as the way to go. Uh, at the moment, we have got about 37 million mobile subscribers in Kenya. We have 94.4% um, you know, coverage of the population on 2G. We have 78% coverage on uh, 3G. But we have over 70% of the adult population using mobile money, which has been uh, a, a key part. When um, <clears throat> mobile money was introduced almost uh, 10, 15 years ago, there was about 4 million bank accounts. Today there's about 28 million bank accounts, you know, mostly using the mobile phone. We have, uh, on top of just using the mobile money, now it's gone regional. We also have companies that are building on top of the mobile money. We have a company called Mcopa. What they've done is they've taken um, solar power and made a, a pay-as-you-go model. So using mobile money, you can actually switch on the, the lights in your house by paying about 50 cents per, per day so that you actually have electricity. They have over 300,000 subscribers now, and that number is growing. So we are seeing penetration of uh, electricity just on the basis of using the mobile money. So from a technology point of view, we're seeing a lot of uh, speed and growth in terms of just using mobile money, using the technologies to innovate and, and to build. 
But broadly, we are working on uh, introducing our 4G services uh, across the country. The challenge with 3G is that the operators, since we have an open market uh, competitive environment, they go just to the <coughs> environments where they make good money as opposed to you know, covering the whole country. So we're looking at different strategies and policies that will ensure we have 4G across the whole country and everybody using the broadband service. A lot of time we've spoken about it, but most people don't actually use uh, broadband. It's key uh, to ensure that the information gap that exists within the country, whether it's for communication or just accessing information, people are able to know what their rights are, how they're able to communicate amongst themselves. So that's been uh, extremely key. And together with that, as a country, as a government, we've also introduced uh, what we're calling laptops uh, for, the, for the children in school. We call it the digital literacy program. It's going to affect both the parents, the teachers, and uh, the students. And so we're expanding to ensure that we're going to have a lot of digital literacy within the country. I think we're one of two countries that has now migrated uh, on the digital side uh, from analog to digital in terms of TV. A very um, difficult time with the media trying to move them now into the digital space, which we finally done. But we saw uh, some huge dividends moving from 14 uh, TV stations now to over 65. We've got over 100 radio stations that are now using the, the digital services. So the dividend from that we hope in terms of spectrum, we can use that also to, to increase the use of broadband in the country. So I would say technology is at the core of everything that we're doing. It's at the same time <clears throat> what we're going to use to ensure as government we're reaching to the farthest corners and providing the citizens with as much uh, access to services. So we have eCitizen, which is about 100 uh, different government uh, services. You can renew your passport, your driving license, you can apply for your visa. All this is being done now online. And it's, it's helping the government become a lot more efficient uh, and quickly. So I would say there's many things we're doing, but from a technology point of view, it is at the heart of everything that we need to see happen. Mm -hmm. and, and finally, from you know, we have got huge fights in terms of corruption, uh, transparency, openness, and technology is really the vehicle we're using. Hmm. to ensure that you know whatever transactions are taking place you can see them they're digital and you can take people to court um, you know for some of the losses we have here and there so technology is key for us can i let me yeah. stephanie can i bring you in just as a sort of a different lens on this one of the sort of a, the, the world bank sort of data driven lens what are you seeing out there in terms of sort of trends and adoption and sort of the the, the pace of change with respect to adoption of some of the technologies we're talking about yeah, so I was actually hit um, first by what Joe said, is that he has 90, some 98% coverage at 2G. Mm -hmm. So I take a step back and say, in the developed world today, there'll be 4 billion Google searches. But that also means that there are 4 billion people on the planet who are not connected to the internet. They don't have an iPhone, they don't have a computer, and they don't have the ability to access that. And they certainly can't do it over a, you know, a, a 2G network. So I think we, we're looking more at a longer view and saying if it really is going to be you know, the Internet of Things and that's a, you know, an 11 trillion market by, by 2025 and 40% of that is supposed to be in emerging markets, how do we actually close that gap? And what is it that we need to do from a development perspective to do that? So first, I think we need to think about how to, so there's a sustain, sustainable development goal, which is let's connect everyone in the world to the Internet. How do we do that? That's going to require public partner, private partnerships. But together with that, um, we did a world development report, which is one of our seminal reports. And what our economists came to the conclusion was that they call it analog technologies. But what they basically argue is that there are three other things that we need to connect the world and actually use technology for the betterment of the world that will, you know, create jobs and growth. Will will provide for inclusion, um, and make a better world. And those are you kind of start at the level of regulation. So how do we actually create business environments in countries that allow for competition? If you look at where many of the um, large internet companies have come, what they've actually created is monopolies. And monopolies aren't necessarily good for growth and inclusion. So how do we create the regulatory environment to allow that? I think the second area is how do we govern the internet? So we hear a lot about cybersecurity. We hear issues about cybersecurity across nations. Um, you know, Qatar just had a, a very large breach. Bangladesh just had a very large breach. So how do we actually govern the internet a, a, across nations and create institutions can, that can do that? 
Um, and I think finally, um, what we also think is really important has to do with skills. So Joe talked a little bit about how they're giving every child in Kenya a laptop. We really believe that we need to think about re-educating people in emerging markets and people in, in, in the broader market on three, you know, kind of three areas. One is technical. So what do we know about technology and how do we use technology? But there are social um, and environmental trainings that are going to have to go on. So how do we work differently? How do we think about our data? How do we think about our personal privacy? So a lot of work has to be done um, in areas around that. Um, and uh, <clears throat> then, it, so, so we can actually then prepare the world and, and take advantage of technologies. And if we don't do that, I think what, what we really believe the downside risk is that you're actually going to create exclusion and you're going to leave huge swaths of the population out. So I've actually been through the list of, of the Milken <coughs> seminars that I want to attend. A lot of them have to do with artificial intelligence, machine learning, robotics. The minute that those enter the equation, that entire middle section, the people that we're trying to pull out of poverty aren't going to make it unless they have the other pieces in place. Um, Dennis, can I bring, thanks Stephanie, can I bring you back in on um, Joe's comment? He was, you were talking a little, Joe, Joe was talking a little bit about broadband and we talked a little bit earlier about sort of the broadband, broadband gap and what have you, but there's you know, some suggestion that maybe broadband, at least as understood in, in, in the developed world, is kind of irrelevant to all of this conversation. Everyone's going straight to mobile, so what difference does it make what's happening on the desktop, that there's this great leap happening, and I know you have sort of some views on what's happening there. Well, I think there's very few countries that have the kind of joined up thinking of Kenya. Um, I've got to compliment the minister because most countries have no real strategy around this. But the key issue is it's, ver it's easy to build a 2G network. It's easy to build a 3G, but it gets much more complicated uh, when you go LTE. And the difficulty now the, the merging world is facing, uh, particularly in remote areas, is that broadband penetration is stalling. So you've got the whole of Asia, you've got the whole of Europe, the US, and most of South America, but then you have Africa, and then you have the outlying regions, for example, in the Pacific, uh, that are, it's struggling, okay? And it's struggling because the viability of putting in towers that are gonna be, whether solar or uh, diesel, is very, very tough. For example, in Papua New Guinea, you know, most of our towers are kind of three or four days walk, there's no roads, and they're using mules, and it costs about a buck fifty a litre, and the tower uses 60 litres a day. Mm. So when you look at the investment uh, of telcos, even the larger ones in Africa, and that they're all saying, we're all having this dialogue where everybody's saying, we can't finance this anymore. Mm -hmm. And there needs to be a new way of funding you know, broadband in these markets in remote areas because it's not going to happen otherwise. So the outlier or the elephant in the room would be the OTTs. And they would be primarily Google and, uh, and Facebook who have done a brilliant job in terms of developing markets for their products. But they're using the train lines, the train tracks of companies like ours or France Telecom or Airtel or all the bigger companies in the emerging world without funding for the networks. So the stall is there now, and unless there's a kind of a new relationship between the OTT people that they're going to give a revenue share on the advertising dollars that they're generating, these, these networks will never be built. It's, it's not going to happen. I, I'm on the UN Broadband uh, uh, Council, and like you were, everybody has the same issues. It's all about, we cannot, keep going at sort of 25% of revenues of CapEx, it's unsustainable. So there needs to be a new deal as such. And when you look at Facebook, they put out their numbers on Friday, they're earning $13 per user. So they have 1.65 billion users uh, at their last quarter. Um, and you know they're making a 30% net margin, but they're not paying a nickel to the people who are paying for the railroad to their customers. So, and they will argue, argue in the most beautiful fashion, like very elegantly, and they have PR machines, and they have hundreds of people on the hill to keep everything happy. Uh, but really, you know, it has to change. So, you know, and Google are probably the biggest offenders as such. So, and the, the second thing that we need is obviously to build fiber optic submarine cables into remote areas as well. And that, you know, a lot of Africa is landlocked. 
the Pacific is like, you know, thousands of miles between the islands. And there needs to be a proper funding model with the World Bank and IFC and private enterprise to build those submarine cables. Otherwise, you, all those economies are going to stagnate without even talking about artificial intelligence and what that means. <laughs> so, so there needs to be a kind of a new paradigm, a new relationship uh, in the way we approach this su subject. So that I, sort of yeah, go ahead. As, as you know, I spent about uh, eight and a half years running Google in Africa. <laughs> so, I didn't want to call you out for that, but I was, <laughs> no, since I, you I'm bring sure it up, someone please. will, and I think it's, it's worth maybe having that uh, conversation. Do but, I need to separate you two? No, no, no. <laughs> no, no. Okay, We're wearing ties. I think okay, if okay. I didn't have my tie, <laughs> where I was before. I, I think the key question is, what would the model be? Because the subscribers currently pay the operators for you know, the infrastructure. So are we saying that the OTTs need to subsidize or what is the exact uh, model? Because for us as government, okay. the challenge is what kind of policy do we put in place? Mm -hmm. At this mm -hmm. stage, we're saying, uh, at least in Kenya, we've had you know, this model where you charge huge uh, fees for spectrum and for licensing. But we're trying to say maybe we have a different way. We, we make it easier for you to pay for the spectrum and the licensing, but we give you conditions as to where you roll out, so you have more coverage. Okay, but, but how how do we work yeah. with the OTTs? It's very, and I'll be uh, quick. Yeah, it, sure. First of all, you know WhatsApp, you know Viper, all these people don't pay local taxes. They pay nothing into the economy. We're paying VAT, sales taxes, usage taxes, spectrum fees, everything. So you know, it's this is even. I didn't want to go with here this morning, but we could spend the morning on that. <laughs> um, I, I think you know what governments need to do is start licensing the. And this sounds like anathema, and it sounds very old-fashioned. Mm -hmm. But you know, if if mobile operators are losing, you know, fifty percent of their voice because of these new applications, you know, it's an uncompetitive situation. You're, you're employing thousands of people, you're paying the capex, you're paying your sales tax, and these guys come straight in over you okay, and right rob your business. Right. So they come to the party, you know, they kiss all the girls and drink all the wine and leave, you know. So <laughs> it is, um, it's a very hot subject. And, it, and, and it, you know, it's only, the, the telecoms industry has sleepwalked into this. Yep, like they've sure. been comatose because none of the CEOs are probably close enough to if they had their own money in their businesses they'd start thinking about this but you know absolute EBITDA margins now have declined by maybe 15 yep. basis points so as a as the only vendor representative up here on the panel <laughs> <laughs> and you are admittedly not <coughs> in the position of Facebook and Google what's what sort of Cisco's position with respect to as you think about CapEx and the needs of you know sort of dealing with sort of the build out of mobile and the broadband gap, like this is a very difficult problem because you yeah, know Yeah, look, I, I think I think there's no doubt that you have to get to a to a different kind of a model and to to enable you know the other sixty percent of the world that's not connected to the internet, right? The four and a half billion that Stephanie talked about earlier, you're gonna have to get to a model that allows you to be able to economically deliver right broadband, whether it's through mobile or otherwise. Uh, to individuals to effectively empower them to be able to either develop, right? I think that's the, that's the other sort of divisional thinking that, that I'd like to bring to the table here, which is that it's not just about being able to bring services to the end user in many of these markets. I think there's a real potential, at least we believe this, that as you think about things like IoT, Internet of Things, uh, and mobile use cases, and to the point that Joe made earlier, in many, in many cases, it's, it's going to happen uh, like in Kenya, where the native experience, the first experience you ever have with the internet is going to be a mobile experience. You're also going to have in many of these developing uh, nations a, a comparative adv advantage of having to solve particularly diff you know, difficult problems, with, whether that's healthcare or the lack of uh, the ability to, to have access to it. Uh, or the ability for you to be able to have a, a banking system, which is probably different than what we've experienced in the developed markets, as uh, Joe eloquently talked about in Kenya. I think there are comparative advantages that allow you to demonstrate development of use cases and business models that are going to compel the developed world, actually, over time to engage differently. And I think that, that actually opens up a possibility of creating a different kind of model for how you roll out these networks. I think because ultimately, I think the use cases that are being developed in the developing markets can be scaled beyond the individual countries in which they're being um, rolled out, but also from a regional perspective and from a global point of view. So that's something that we spend a lot of time thinking about. I also believe that as you look at the, the penetration of 
developing market companies into, as an example, an index like the, the Fortune Global 500, you know, probably flat for the 80s through 2000 at 5%, you know, jumping to 17% in, uh, in 2010 and close to 30% in 2013. You know, the forecast here being close to 50% of the Fortune 500 by, by 2026. I, I don't think you can see getting there until you have the ability to, to drive some of these, some of these models. And, and ultimately, we believe that connectivity, broadband, the acceleration of that is going to provide much more opportunity for developing uh, uh, countries and their companies to be much more global in scale. Again, going back to the business models and technologies that can be developed inside of those markets themselves. So let me, we, we talk about sort of use cases and technology and we're sort of, you know, there's a, temp, there's a tendency to become really sort of deterministic about it and just talk about it as if sort of it's all this sort of homogenous group. And so what I thought would be good, we'll get, um, maybe get Kentour to talk a little bit about, I mean, one of your concerns, which is really bringing it down to the level of people, that there's people who are gaining immense advantage from the introductions of these technologies in developing markets and there are people who are being left behind and that's creating inequality. Yeah, thank you. So, you know, you opened uh, with, you know, kind of touching on this potential paradox of technology. Sometimes it seems like it's terrific and sometimes it's not. Um, so I'm going to uh, put out there a juxtaposition of two facts that anybody can look up right now online if they wanted to. And it's basically the following. So in the United States, uh, over the last uh, 40, 45 years, um, you know, we've had a golden age of digital innovation, right? This is the same period of time in which we've had the internet, cell phones, Facebook, Google, Apple, everything that you think of as digital innovation has basically happened in the last uh, 45 years. <coughs> During that same span of time, this country uh, has experienced um, rising inequality, uh, the medium income has declined, um, you know, p politics has become more, more polarized than ever. So any facile conception that the introduction and invention of new digital technologies in and of itself causes poverty to go away or helps people who are uh, not in, um, you know, not the ones who have uh, privileged access to technology um, is, you know, flawed in some way. And I think this goes back to something that Stephanie mentioned, which is that you need this analog foundation to be there. The way I explain this is that technology amplifies underlying human forces. And I would you know, say that the reason why we're not seeing that technology contribute to declining poverty in the United States is, as a country, we're not yet really focused on uh, the elimination of poverty. And so what happens is even though we have these great technologies, they're not in any way amplifying an underlying social force. Uh, I used to work at Microsoft. I helped the company found a uh, research lab in India. And we focused on trying to find different ways to use digital technologies to alleviate you know, uh, problems in agriculture, healthcare, education, governance, and so forth. And what I saw repeatedly, um, you know, despite the fact that I was a coming from a computer science uh, perspective and really tr wanting to see these technologies uh, do something for poverty, was that in the end, uh, the missing elements of the, again, the human foundation that you need for technology to really um, uh, cause positive change are critical. They, if they're not there, then they don't really, uh, they don't really help people who are uh, either poor or undereducated or socially not sufficiently connected to centers of power. So even though I do think that on the one hand uh, it's great that we have these technologies, you know, sometime in the last year uh, the, uh, the world basically saw the situation where the number of cell phone accounts in the world has exceeded the total human population. Um, you know, we're not seeing an end to uh, global poverty because of the technology as such unless we also put in the right kinds of policies uh, and so on. So St Stephanie, I'll bring that back to you as sort of, you know, someone who's sort of globally canvassing all of this and thinking about it in global terms. Talk a little bit about some of the policy experiments or other that you're seeing out there in terms of you know, governments. What are people doing? What, what, what experiments do you see happening out there at the governmental level or at the pri or private experiments even, like Dennis is describing, that you think are worth knowing about, that are we can learn from? And we all saw, I think, probably what happened, what was it, six months ago when Facebook got spanked for uh, trying to create this arrangement in India yeah. where they would have a subsidized, and we can talk a little bit about that experiment because it was a really interesting one. And I think a lot of people probably walked away thinking, well, that's something I won't try. And maybe it wasn't such a, maybe they walked away with the wrong lesson. Yeah, open, free, and safe, I think are three words that we would use to, to describe how the internet ought to be. And I think one of the reasons why Facebook is struggling with Internet Zero is that it's not free. Again, it's it's you know it's creating a uh, a relationship with a carrier and then you know uh, giving a few things for free and then charging for the use of that data. So it doesn't make the internet free. Um, but I you know less from a regulatory perspective and more from a private sector perspective. The most interesting things that I see going on right now um, 
is how do we actually take big data and use data sets to try to solve some of the emerging markets problems. Mm. So we were talking a little bit about how do you create uh, credit bureaus. So how do you actually lend money to people? So um, there's a really uh, interesting um, company that went to Jamaica. And in Jamaica, they actually have a credit bureau and they have micro lending. And they were able to take that and marry it together with cell phone data and say, OK, there's correlations here that are pretty strong. So let's take what we know about that mobile data and take it to Kenya and use it off of M-Pesa and see if we can actually create credit bureaus. Mm -hmm. So if we can begin to think about using big data and data collection um, and data sets that are a bit disparate uh, to the naked eye, we can actually begin to solve, again, some of the more interesting development problems. But I think it goes back to what are those analog regulations, policies, um, things like that that are going to drive the use of technology because it's not just about creating connectivity. I, I actually think that broadband will come when there is a business if it can be funded by the, the, the private sector. Um, I, I think I go back to when I look back in history and we've asked the, and we the World Bank group too, this is IFC in the bank, um, we've asked the private sector to do all the development in, in telecom and technology. So the reason why there's not enough broadband connectivity is that the private sector isn't going to fund it. You know, the connectivity that exists in Europe and the United States was built with tax dollars before, you know, AT&T was privatized and, and, you know, before Deutsche Telekom and, and France Telecom, all government funded. And we've then turned to the, to the developing world and said, build the infrastructure with the private sector only mm. because infrastructure can be built by the private sector. And I think if you look at the gap um, that exists today, we've, we've proven that it can't be built by the private sector and that 2G is not sufficient. You can't run an iPhone on a 2G network. People, and, and you know, not necessarily that people can afford iPhones, but what you really need is LTE. And mm -hmm. How do you drive that? Mm -hmm. um, just so we're going to open up for questions in a couple of minutes and uh, let some other folks into the conversation. So by all means, if you have questions in mind, start or would like to have some questions, have, by all means, start framing them. Dennis, I want to I want to bring you back in on this point with respect to some of you know your comment with respect to uh, you know new models and things. What was your view on the on the Facebook Zero project in India? What do you think went wrong there? It was too good for Facebook <laughs> and very bad for, you know, the carriers there. I mean, India is a shockingly difficult market mm -hmm. uh, because everybody's had to buy new spectrum, go back to auctions, spend billions of dollars. You know, it is, uh, it's a nightmare for investors, to be honest with you, India. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't see that changing uh, any time soon under Mr. Modi. Um, I think the... We, like, we've had lots of discussions with Google and, you know, f lovely chats, uh, but at the end of the day, nothing happened. And so what we did was we invested in a company called Shine in Israel. And they have developing, developed, you know, embedded uh, ad blocking technology. So we have rolled this out across all our networks across the world uh, in about 30 countries. So now all the Google ads are gone, Facebook ads are gone. I bet you get calls about that. No, we don't. Oh, Our great. customers love it because I met from Google. Oh no, we have no. They're they're trying to figure out what next. But I, all my other colleagues in the industry are now getting a bit braver as well. <laughs> but when somebody turns on their phone in the morning, you know, if you're on, uh, you know, if you're spending fifty cents or a dollar a day, about twenty five percent of your data is used on downloading ads that you don't want. So you're using up your data. So whereas you know, we went to Google and said, look. We'd like a revenue share because we're building all these beautiful networks. And they said, no way, we're not giving you any. That's not in our model. Um, we want to keep all the money for ourselves. So now they will have to actually pay for the data when they do a deal with us and mm -hmm. other companies. Mm -hmm. They'll have to pay for the data as well. Mm -hmm. So it's a double whammy for them. And this is coming because you know Deutsche Telekom, Sprint, all the big, big players are, and Vodafone are really looking at this technology. So this is a creep up on the OTTs, whereas if they had gone into some sort of a relationship and a partnership, they wouldn't be in the situation uh, they're in today. So they're struggling back in Mountain View as to what they should do with people like us. Now we're small, but I can see a lot of the people, the big guys like Airtel, MTN, all the big players getting involved. And Customers can say, yeah, we want an opt-in, we'll take the ads. Now, in Europe, because of all this nonsense about net neutrality, they have to opt out if they want ads. But those opt-out rates are 35% and growing in some of the trial markets in Europe. So it is a big creeping issue. And hopefully, at the end of the day, there will be some sit-down with the industry and the OTT people where some sort of sense will prevail. 
Joe, do you want to weigh, on, weigh in on this? I'm just curious what sorts of private sector, doesn't, not specifically on Facebook Zero one way or the other, I don't want to draw you out unless, of course, you want to be drawn out. Right. Um, but just in terms of some of these kinds of, because I'm sure you, you get these kinds of entreaties all the time, that if you, we can partner on this project and we'll share in this way, if you help us set this up. And so you get those kinds of you know, cross-subsidization discussions with the private sector all the time, I'm sure. So, so Facebook uh, Free Basics, you know, as they're calling it, <clears throat> basically it's a partnership between Facebook and the operator. Actually, the operator is the one that pays uh, for, the, for the free connectivity. Facebook is not the one that has been paying. In the case of our market, I think, you know, the number one issue as far as broadband is concerned is that people are not aware the value they get from uh, using broadband, in which case they, they would, they're quite happy to stay on the 2G network. And it's primarily because the phones they have, if they get a smartphone, they have to charge it twice a day. If they have a feature phone, they can keep it for one week. Mm. So for me and for Kenya, I think we would accept free basic. We would expect, uh, accept any connectivity that is given to the consumers, which will get them to understand the value of what they will get. Even though with the net neutrality, they are primarily getting just access to Facebook uh, products. But I am very happy to hear this fight, and, and I'm seeing the the way it, it is panning out. In the end, I think it's going to be for the consumer that will benefit. Yes. My concern is that our markets, uh, the the emerging markets, are really not that large for the for the OTTs in terms of revenue. So if you look at uh, the African revenue for Google it's not significant for them to, uh, to engage in that fight. So I hope it's, they're not going to be fighting and then deciding, I think that's not a fight for us and therefore we won't see growth. I hope everybody will want to be in that space and, uh, and fight so that then we can have broadband for everybody. It's, uh, it, it's great that uh, that war is, uh, is happening. And, uh, you, can have, you can join <laughs> us in the war. <laughs> Our, ours is from, you know, from, a, from, a, from, you know, from a government point of view to insist on, you know, that this changes because that is going to change 2G to LTE across the whole of Kenya. Key thing is to know exactly how, so, so for instance, Netflix is based in the US, they host all their services in the US. If as government we go out and say we're going to start taxing them, first we don't have the, the legal right to be able to do that. And secondly, unless we now block as a country, you know, for some of these services, it becomes a lot more complicated. So if we can partner with the operators, maybe we just come to the table, all of us, and just have a conversation as to how this should be done. I think that might work. But regulation on its own will be fairly difficult for each country. Maybe at the ITU level, that, that, those conversations could be had. Um, but I hope it happens faster so that we have a broadband quicker. But for us, as a country, we want to see everyone on broadband. Access to information, access to government services, access to other markets and international markets is, is critical and 2G networks will not serve anything. So Do you, I, yeah, I, I was I, just gonna, yeah I, I'm gonna throw in a slightly controversial statement about you know, this desire to get everybody internet access, which is that um, you know, I believe that the vast majority of people who can make meaningful economic use of the internet already have the internet right now. Uh, and that everybody else is not sufficiently in the knowledge economy to really benefit in a dramatic way from the supposed two-way uh, communication of information that the internet allows in a way above and beyond what you know, communication infrastructures already exist. Um, and one way you can see that is, you know, so I live in Ann Arbor, I'm about an hour away from Detroit. Uh, you know, if you go to Detroit, everybody there has a phone and they have, many of them have smartphones, many of them use Facebook on a regular basis. Um, but they are not climbing out of poverty in any meaningful sense. They are not uh, able to help themselves out of a situation which, you know, in this case, I think, uh, is due to m many, you know, much larger economic forces. And that's largely true of people in the developing world. Uh, you know, many of the people who don't currently have um, uh, the internet on their mobile phones, even if they do have a mobile phone, are people, for example, who are you know, physical laborers on farms where it really it doesn't make too much of a difference if you can have access to the latest agronomic research paper uh, as a way to, you know, improve your farming. Um, you know, these are things that I think we would like to believe, but the, you know, the, at this point, you know, we used to talk about how if once we get mobile phones to everybody, that was going to dramatically change the situation for uh, people in rural communities, and that just hasn't happened. Helton, I feel like this is your chance to, 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 to stage a, an intervention. <laughs> well, look, I, and convince I, him that he's, he's wrong. It's, I mean, I, 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 I hear the argument, but I think that as you, as you consider a world 
in which um, the internet actually begins to, to transform and digitize pretty much every industry within both developing as well as developed economies, there's a real potential that instead of this, this use case, right, that we're all sort of imagining of consuming massive amounts of content on a mobile device, whether it's entertainment or you know, data for productivity, really trying to, to take the internet to things that, that ultimately can benefit from standard connectivity, right? So whether that is in agriculture, whether that is in transport, uh, whether that is in healthcare, I actually fundamentally believe that all those industries in the developing markets actually are an opportunity uh, for a comparative advantage, right? Because the problems are actually pretty substantial and huge to benefit from, from IT uh, and, and the internet in a different way than, than has been experienced actually even in, even in the developed markets. And I think that one of the things that is a, is a big challenge as you sort of look at that vision of things is the ability for uh, many of these, these environments to have the right level of skills and capabilities to actually keep up with all of that change. And so I think education is going to be a major piece of this, um, both in the IT space as well as uh, obviously more fundamentally. And you know, as, as, um, you know, as I reflect on what our company is, is doing, it's a small bit. But things like network academies, which some of you may be aware of, where you know, we're training entry-level IT professionals, mostly in the developed, uh, developing markets. So you know, 6 million um, students through the program, 1 million currently uh, across uh, 170 countries. You know, things like that are going to have to be critical to be able to make that transition. So I, th I think my argument here is that fundamentally, the developing markets in uh, the basic services and industries that are going to be transformed potentially by the internet uh, as a, is a far more interesting opportunity than just the simple the concept of, of consuming productivity and, uh, and entertainment tools on a mobile device. So, so Paul, can I just jump yeah, in one second? So yeah. um, if we can extrapolate from what Hilton just said, so there's 9 billion connected devices in the world today. People say, well, you heard Al Gore, right? By, by 2025, we're going to have 50 billion connected devices. All of those devices are supposed to do things like help with climate change. They're going to create smart cities. We're going to do all these kinds of things, right? If there's still 60% of the world that are, you know, are not connected to the internet, and we're going to rely on 2G networks to carry the data for those 25 billion devices, 50 billion devices, is not going to happen. No. So there's this massive gap that's existing, and unless we can get the right policy and regulation and governance of the internet across, I, I actually think the divide's going to get wider, and what you're going to see is smart, citi smart cities in the developed world, and you're going to see developing cities that continue to pollute and continue to create you know, issues with climate change. So we've got to tie all those mm. things together, and it really starts with connectivity, and then from there, how do you develop the analog pieces that, that solve for some of these other problems. I want to bring well, Joe back in here. Oh, go ahead, sure. If you want no, to. I was going to say I, I don't agree with the, <laughs> with the gentleman in terms of the internet is going to make a change. It, it, is, it is critical for people. And I think the fact that um, maybe some of the people in the West haven't come out of poverty because they have not used their devices well is not the same for Africa. It's not the same for us in the emerging markets. One. There is currently over 10 million jobs available today online that people can actually do, but they're not aware of how they can access those jobs. I'll give an example of Amazon's mechanical tech, where they have basic jobs like just classifying receipts, and you're paid something like two cents for deciding this receipt was for entertainment, this one was for petrol. I mean, it doesn't require a lot of intelligence, but you need connectivity to be able to access those jobs. We have got huge populations in our markets that have no job, yet there is all those jobs available online. If they were made aware of how to access those jobs, they got the devices, they got the connectivity, they will work. Because the number one demand for most of the youth we have is they want jobs. And I think technology is going to be able to create that. So it's our task as governments and as policy makers to ensure that the quality of uh, devices and access to those devices in terms of cost is, uh, is much better. We're looking for ways of actually subsidizing those devices, subsidizing the networks. So that, you know, for me, broadband is almost like air. It's so important we should not charge for it. And so any model that's going to allow us to get our people to have access to broadband, it means they will be able to compete. We've seen uh, huge numbers of people gain access to credit just because they're able to use their mobile phone. Uh, there's a company I was a director of before I got into government called Jumo, Just Mobile. 
And in a period of six months, it became the largest credit supplier in, the, in Tanzania and in Uganda. We had millions of uh, subscribers. Yes, they could borrow even up to 60 cents and go do something. And within 10 days, they've actually repaid. The, you know, you've got uh, their data and information. I think it's how we in leadership, in businesses, provide the information that our citizens need to be able to use the services. So if, if there is going to be jobs available online, then I expect uh, our citizens are going to riot and say, we have to have broadband, <laughs> we're going to have these devices so that we can have jobs. Mm -hmm. and, and so we're going to hopefully create that demand. Mm -hmm. And with Dennis and the other operators, we're going to find ways of working the OTTs to ensure that everyone has free broadband, Dennis, yeah? Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, I can't, I can't I want to give you a chance to, are you, sure. are you convinced? Are you oh, no, I mean, you know, I've heard all these arguments before. I mean, there are certainly, you know, things on the margins that technology is going to support and help in and of itself. Um, but, you know, again, you know, people brought up education and things like this. So, you know, several years ago, uh, when massive open online courses were all the rage, and people would say, oh, you know, now that we have these course materials <coughs> online for free, anybody who, you know, can get online will, has access to a college education, right? We no longer need to send our kids to expensive colleges, pay tens of thousands of dollars for intuition. Um, so, you know, these very same entities basically have collected a large amount of data, uh, and they know who their, um, who their users are. And what they find is that, uh, is that the people who actually complete courses online are predominantly professional white male people with jobs, not jobless high school dropouts who are desperately in need of an education. And that's you know, exactly illustrating this point about amplification that I like to uh, make, which is that if you already have an education, then you can make use of those materials online in a way that is you know, to your advantage. If you don't have some basic level of education and don't have some internal capacity to learn on your own, then it just doesn't make a difference how much material there is online. You're not going to be the one who's going to motivate yourself to put in the extra hours of studying uh, you know, after a hard day's uh, um, uh, job to, to, uh, to get that education. And so that kind of principle that you know, in some sense the educated rich get richer uh, with more material online, I think holds. Um, I agree that on the one hand, you know, we do want, uh, you know, we want to close various uh, divides, whether they're digital divides or not. But I think there's an error in thinking that the digital divide itself is the cause of these other social economic divides instead of vice versa, which is to say that the social economic divide causes the digital ones. I mean, you know, all of us uh, here have, you know, fancy gadgets and so on. It's not because we have those gadgets that we are able to do the work that we want. It's because we have great jobs and the education to get those jobs that we are able to afford those gadgets. And so, um, you know, I really, I actually like the you know, World Bank's World Development Report quite a bit because it really emphasizes this importance of the analog foundation. I don't see it as the second thing that we need after technology. I think it's the first thing that we need. And in an interesting way, if you fix those analog challenges, then all of the technologies we already have work in our favor and then help us alleviate uh, inequality as well. I want to give you a chance to weigh in here, Dennis, on this. If you, and I also want to, if there's folks here in the room who have questions, by all means, just sort of raise your hand and we'll start getting a microphone over. There's a question over here on the side and on the far left side, if we can move, bring a mic over there and then I'll get, let you. So you can, can I just say that oh, sure. I, I agree um, that it's our responsibility then as policymakers Sorry. and governments to educate. Okay. Uh, our citizens and population. So yeah. from that point of view, I think uh, finally we have an agreement <laughs> that we have a role well, uh, and, to play. And, and I think, I think, yeah. I, I think that the, the notion that technology <coughs> in and of itself, whether it's, you know, whether it's mobile, cloud, network, broadband, is a panacea. I, I, don't, think, um, I don't think anybody on this panel would, would espouse that view. And I think the view that, that um, technology is a, a tool alongside of policy in the private sector, I think doing thoughtful uh, and collective things to be able to address fundamental issues that already exist and as a way to go and drive growth and sustainability as a result is fundamentally what you need to get to. But you know, technology in and of itself is, is, is insufficient, but I do think it's a necessary condition to be able to drive some of the changes we're talking about. Uh, we just, I've got a, we've got a bunch of questions in the room, and I want to give people a chance to ask by all means. Please, just if you quickly introduce yourself and then go yeah, ahead. Thank you very much, Kriva uh, I'm the Minister of Finance from Rwanda. Uh, I was just very interested in what it actually has been discussed here. But I think uh, the main focus here is maybe looking at the capacity and the jobs, but not really how to reduce the cost of doing business. Mm. And in our own case, we saw in Rwanda we are now moving to 4G LTE, and now the whole uh, seat has been 
recovered, and now we are moving to the whole the rest of the country. And I was the governor of the central bank before that. And I saw how when the broadband was introduced, how it helped the entire banking system completely. How the financial management, the extension to the rural areas, and also the fast transfer of money using the real-time growth settlements. We saw how it became very, very useful. And that's the time our banking system started using the more core banking system that you see here in North America because of that, of that capacity. So that has helped the financial inclusion move from 42% in uh, 2008, and now it is 89% mm -hmm. in terms of financial inclusion. Mm -hmm. But also what we see is the use of mobile phone. Now in Rwanda, everybody, a mobile phone is almost your whole industry. In terms of the rural people, they don't, have, they don't need to move anywhere for government services. We have one online, which is one gateway mm -hmm. that everybody uses for any kind of services. The cost of moving from the rural areas, looking for administrative offices, that has gone. The way of paying taxes, they are now using the phone. They don't have to face uh, the tax uh, man uh, anywhere. And then we see them trans uh, in the way they transact, the way they buy fertilizer, the way you buy for any uh, kind of services using your mobile phone. Mm. So I think the cost of really doing business mm. has really been very that's significant. Great. Thank so you. That's the point I wanted to make. Thank oh, you. That's a, that's a really so, so, so everyone got that, I'm sure, just this notion that the cost of doing <coughs> business is really maybe the fundamental transformative force that we're seeing here. Uh, there was a question over here on the side. There's one on the left there. Yeah. And over here as well. Just throw it. <laughs> we're Thanks. We're all here. <coughs> Thanks so much. I wanted to just raise a couple issues with the points that Dennis made about uh, ad blocking. Uh, I should. I work for Google. I'm going to reveal that right from the start. I'm Ross Lajeunesse, and I lead international relations for the company. I, I think that there is definitely a problem with advertising in the sense that, you know, a lot of consumers don't like it. Uh, you know, they find it intrusive, and the ads suck, and you know, I, we get that. But I do think that there's an issue with taking an approach where, <clears throat> excuse me, um, all advertising is blocked at the network level and that the decision is made by the telco operator because the vast majority of startups and the vast majority of content on the web now is supported by advertising. So if you develop a world where that financial support goes away, you quickly get to a point uh, where there are a lot of startups and a lot of publishers of information who are unsustainable. So Google's approach has always been, if you're a user of Google, you don't like ads, we give you, you know, controls to block those advertising, that advertising on your account. But I think that's very different from a world in which operators block all advertising indiscriminately because that will really change the nature of the web. Okay, thank you. I'll let Dennis. Well, you know, with, there's been lots of conversations with your company, and I'm happy to have a conversation with you afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think really, you know, that's a bit of a canard point you're making because, you know, you earn 80 billion or 90 billion of revenues, and you don't share any of that money with anybody that provides the infrastructure to go to your customers. So, you know, you have forced us, and, and there's going to be a lot more of us, uh, into a situation where we're now ad blocking. But you've got to look at this from the consumer's point of view. They're turning on their phone and they're paying data charges to download your ads that you, you know, repatriate back to the US where you have, I think, cash and marketable securities about 70, 80 billion in your bank account. So I think it's time for you to kind of come to Jesus or else go on the Camino and kind of find a new way, think it all the way through, and think how can we be partners in developing and bringing the world broadband. But you know, I, I have a great worry that the world is going to go two speed here. I don't agree with my friend from Ann Arbor where you know, the consumer gets a, a, a phone, a smartphone in Detroit, it doesn't make any difference in their lives. It is absolutely profound in Africa if you get a smartphone, the changes to your life. So, it's all about balance and sharing and cooperation rather than saying to everybody in the telecoms industry. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, question here. Oh, okay. go ahead. 
Um, I serve as the Honorary Consul General for the Republic of Zambia. Um, I am based here. Um, a couple of things. Uh, with regards to the, the little battle going on there between <laughs> regarding the infrastructure, uh, I think it was mentioned earlier on, I get the example of how the networks in the US and in Europe were built based on um, taxpayer money. And it's really around that concept of if you build it, they will come. Um, if it worked here, then I think it can work as well in Africa. I think um, uh, the, the more that you have a widespread network built out, um, I think you will start to see, like the examples that have been given by the Honorable Minister, that that development will take place. The question I did have, though, and I'm glad that you spoke earlier on, is regarding Google. Uh, I haven't heard any um, discussion around the Loon uh, project, mm -hmm. which uh, with the balloons and all of that, I mean, that's LTE right there. I know it's still in development. But if we're talking about growing into an mm -hmm. LTE system, mm -hmm. why hasn't that come up in any of the discussions here? A couple of those balloons have fallen in Zambia, so we're still mm -hmm. trying to find ways to get them back to you. <laughs> but um, uh, I think there's tremendous hope uh, for that as well. If anybody could speak to that. Do you want, group, anyone want to? Yeah, we're, we're, we're a partner. We're actually a partner of yours so, in Loon in Papua New Guinea. Does anyone want to qu just quickly explain yep. what it is just so people oh, know? Oh, it's, uh, it's balloons, low orbit balloons. <laughs> No, <laughs> you tell it. <laughs> yeah, you tell it. Yeah, it's better. It's your product. <laughs> Actually, I've been working on the Loom program, so I'll take it over from Dennis, nope. if you don't mind. Okay. So, Short, the, the, though. Uh, the basic concept behind Loon is that there are, just think of, hot, of uh, weather balloons, basically. They, they are uh, floating around uh, above the, the space where commercial airliners typically operate. And they serve as a way of beaming broadband down to very difficult to reach locations. Uh, that's basically the, the concept of it. The eventual idea is there will be a ring of these things orbiting the, around the world and reaching the most difficult places geographically to reach. Or after disasters, when regular infrastructure goes down, you deploy these balloons and they go down. I would love to take the opportunity to battle it out with Dennis because I have some thoughts on it, but I will turn over the mic. Um, we'll do it outside. Okay. All right, we will. We'll get the pistols yes. ready. <laughs> <laughs> um, does anyone, while we're passing the mic, so I make a comment the, on the, the important thing to that is even if you look at the satellite industry, um, I think what projects like Loon do is actually prove out a business model in a, in a specific region, and then they're going to need to go away. The technology is very complex. The handoff between balloons is very complex, and what you really need is a pipe. And that pipe needs to either be in the ground or be in the airways. And so I think what we'll see is Loon will, projects like Loon will actually prove out a business model in, in more rural areas. And then the infrastructure teams will come in and, and build. And they'll either do it because we're going to change some of the way we allocate spectrum and we'll use some different pieces of the spectrum, or we'll actually build physical pipes. But there has to be a recognition that there are parts of the world for which building fiber will never be economic or possible. Parts of even New Zealand, where you know, speaking with that ministry, they're just—that's never going to happen. Yeah. I agree that this is early stage, but the most interesting thing to note about Loon is we didn't know whether this would really work when we launched it in New Zealand. It is working. They're staying up three times as long as we had expected, and all the data is, you know, proving that this is a very real project that has some some real value. Yeah. So I liked what Al Gore. Today, uh, I, today I said think, about yeah. no, 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 yeah. yes, right? Because there's 120 million people in this country that don't have access to the internet, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's too expensive to build out fiber. We'll solve that problem, and the cost curve, just like they did with GSM, will come down right. if we can actually prove out shared business models, and it's going to be infrastructure sharing in we've, some way. We've, we've only got about five minutes left, so I want to give people, if you could rapid fire some questions, we'll see what we can do. Well, I, ho I hope that the weather balloon, uh, that the balloons have a longer lifespan than weather balloons, because weather balloons are not really long in the atmosphere. Okay, my, my name is Thomas Witt. I'm representing Codeurs, a management consulting in climate change and sustainability sustainability matters, and a non-profit, which is uh, Technology Without Borders, is a German non-profit organization. And uh, we have projects in developing countries for water, energy, education, waste, and we have projects, for example, in Eritrea. Uh, that's a water project, and we have difficulty of communication with the people in the uh, local government uh, for water projects because they only have access to internet every two weeks. So that's really not helpful to have a constant uh, exchange and getting anywhere soon because we built a groundwater storage dam for actually providing a whole valley with mm. precipitation uh, kept water for the whole summer. So I know as well in Uganda there's a project where 
uh, the government is using um, to, to uh, lay, out, lay down pipes uh, for supplying water to uh, all the people. Uh, and you can buy mobile phone actually say where is a problem of supply. So by actually having a network, uh, a mobile network, you are enabling people to actually raise their concerns and their uh, demands and then actually you can as well only achieve to uh, lay down uh, infrastructure for Millennium Gold. So I think that's very important to emphasize that it's not necessarily uh, that you need to know and, and you know, mm -hmm. it's, it's really to have an infrastructure to leverage actually okay. uh, those, those goals. Great. Okay, thank you for that. Um, there's a hand right here. Yep. Right beside you. <laughs> Hi, Kate Ambrose, Latin American Private Equity and Venture Capital Association. I haven't heard you talk about China. Mm -hmm. um, what is the, you know, what have they succeeded in in terms of creating infrastructure? Obviously, there are issues around, um, you know, blocking access to certain content by the government. Is there anything to learn on the positive or the negative side in terms of what China's achieved in access infrastructure and uh, models on, on monetizing? Do you want to? Anything you want to talk to with respect to China or yeah, I mean, Stephanie? look, I think I think China is a, a great example of a of a country that over the last twenty or thirty years has has obviously accelerated the the build out not just of of basic infrastructure uh, and then now obviously broadband, uh, but is, is also facing some of these issues that we've talked about here at the at the country level. You know, how do you continue to do, go and drive um, a business model and use case into the rural parts of the of the country while you, while you on the other end of the spectrum, are, are driving uh, massive levels of the smart cities um, and, and consolidation of, of urbanization within the, um, uh, the, eastern, you know, the eastern part of the country. So you know, we're obviously a big, um, a big presence in China. We continue to invest aggressively. Uh, and we believe it's a, uh, it's a country where some of these models are going to be um, relevant, not just for, for China, but also for the broader developing markets. Yeah, I would just add that you know the the Chinese have done a very good job of building out broadband. It's government money that's built that broadband, and now they're actually able to leverage it to do things like smart cities. So, we got time for one more question. If it's quick, yeah. Thank you, Samia Malham from the World Bank. To Stephanie's point on infrastructure sharing, we estimate around four hundred fifty billion to connect the next one and a half billion. Mm. What are the panel's views on combining infrastructure investment with water, with energy? Uh, roads, etc., and why hasn't worked so far? Thanks. I, I think the different well. investment groups, you know, obviously, people, there's a gentleman here um, warring, doing water projects in Eritrea. I, it's difficult to find investors that straddle all of them. Um, I think there is a real opportunity to be working with the IFC and the World Bank, particularly in the, in the trunk submarine cable area as well, into remote regions. And that has to be a priority. I mean, otherwise, you're going to have countries that will never attract any investment at all, whether it's tourism or any other basic you know, manufacturing, light manufacturing or anything, unless broadband is there. So you will have this two-speed world that's going to be accentuated. At a policy level in government in Kenya, one of the things we've said is uh, any roads that are now being built, there must be trunking for fiber. Mm. The same thing with any yeah. of the power cables that are being done. Uh, the, the grid, that is going to be fiber at least available. So. <clears throat> for the telco market itself, we've uh, got an infrastructure sharing bill that is coming out and they're already beginning to do that. So there's clear ways that we feel this can go. Um, but again, as uh, Dennis has said, there's a lot of uh, business and politics to go with all that. So you can't combine all that infrastructure just yet. We are at the end of our time. So I want to have you join me in thanking our panels for a spirited conversation. Thank you.